It's time for Herd Mentality, the weekly episode where you control the discussion today on Locked on Bills. You are Locked on Bills, your daily Buffalo Bills podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Bills Mafia? It's Joe Marino, author of Go Bills and Buffalo's Run, also the co-host of the Locked On NFL Scouting Podcast, and I'm your host of Locked On Bills. want to thank you for making Locked On Bills your first listen every day, and please be sure to subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. BetterHelp connects you with a licensed therapist who can take you on that journey of self-discovery from wherever you are. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOn today to get 10% off your first month. Well, folks, happy Monday. We're going to start the week with herd mentality. And the reason why is I had anticipated doing the Bills draft defensive tackle primer today, but I have a few more players I want to watch, and I don't want to rush it. And so we're going to push that to tomorrow and move herd mentality up one day. So let's do it. We got some great stuff to dive into. Love this first question here from JD. JD says, had a question slash thought following some recent podcasts. I've been listening to the show for years now, and I don't think I've ever heard you so dialed in on one position slash prospect as you are with middle linebacker and Jack Campbell. Fans and other knowledgeable Bills analysts seem to be feeling the same way. With that said, Bean loves to have most needs addressed going into a draft so he isn't pigeonholed. It makes me think that they're far more comfortable with what they have and what they think could be available once cuts start than other folks seem to think they should be. Do you think we could all be overstating their need to fill that hole with a high pick? Love this question, J.D. And I have a lot to say. Let's start with this. And one thing that I I get to every single year when it comes to the Bills and the draft, I haven't quite said it yet this year, but I've said it every other year. You can't marry yourself to any one outcome. You can't do it. There's too many unknowns when it comes to who's going to be available and what's going to happen with the players once you draft them anyways. You can never marry yourself to any one outcome. And while I have been a huge champion for the Bills and drafting specifically linebacker Jack Campbell in the first round, I'm not sitting here saying that it's Jack Campbell or bust in the first round. I am not saying that at all. I just have a lot of concern about the current state of middle linebacker, and I have a lot of concern about the options in this draft. I just don't feel like there are that many players that make sense to be able to come in and be a plug-and-play Mike Linebacker. Now, you make a good point here. There's a really good chance that Brandon Bean and the organization doesn't view the need quite like we do, or at least I do. They just took Terrell Bernard with a top 90 pick last year, presumably in anticipation of this very moment. And they've spent a year with the guy. They they should have a pretty good understanding of what type of makeup he has and if he can do it. And so, yes, I'm totally mindful of that. However, I don't look at Terrell Bernard that way, and I look at this massive hole, and it just seems very obvious to me. I feel a lot of urgency about it. But I am far from at the point where it's Jack Campbell or nothing. I, I want to make that very, very clear. And as I work through all these position groups, my entire, the big picture here conversation with all the position groups and draft prospects that we're talking about is I'm grading them all and I'm stacking a bill specific board. And so by the end of this process, before the draft, I will deliver my bill specific draft board. So you can see exactly in order how I would draft players. If I had the first pick, the 10th pick, whatever pick, you'll be able to see peel them off. The highest one's the one I would pick. And if that player is Jack Campbell, it'll be Jack Campbell. If that player is Brian Brzee, defensive tackle from Clemson, it'll be Brian Brzee. 
and I'll make sure that everyone is able to have that resource for them. But yes, I am definitely on this for sure. I'm on this hill. There's no question, but let's be careful to not ever marry yourself to any one outcome. I'm just concerned about middle linebacker, and I think Jack Campbell's a great fit, and so it just makes a lot of sense. But I'm open to a lot of possibilities. But I, the other thing that you mentioned there, J.D., is Brandon Bean does do a very good job of entering the draft in such a way that he's not pigeonholed into any one position. I would say last year might be a little bit different where felt like everything was addressed but cornerback. Right? It was... Dane Jackson, Trey White coming off of an ACL tear. You felt like it was a big need, especially with Levi Wallace leaving for the Pittsburgh Steelers. And here we are again. And so maybe that is the case with middle linebacker. And so for as much as we can talk ourselves into thinking that, well, maybe they do really believe in Bernard and Dotson. Maybe this is just Brandon Bean kind of doing what he did last year and addressing everything but that one spot he feels like he can address in the first round. Let's move on to the next one here from James. James says, how do you go about figuring team needs when heading into a draft? For the Bills this year, Mike Linebacker is the largest immediate need, but then you have spots like defensive tackle where there is a need for depth in 2023 and no player, players signed in 2024 and defensive end with questions about Von Miller coming off of an ACL. I think that would be an interesting topic. Like this question, James, and obviously I spent a lot of time evaluating rosters and talking about needs. And the way that I get there is hopefully something that you found very transparent throughout all of our conversations since the Bills lost to the Bengals in the playoffs. All of those conversations, the performance review series, the the conversations that we had about growing the roster from within, the deep dives into some of the polarizing players, really understanding the free agents and players added to their roster, all of that is intended to build an awareness of the understanding of what the Bills have to determine what they need. And so from there, I'm able to say, okay, I think they're the needs. And that's why I did an episode on Brandon Bean's off-season to-do list. And so from there, you kind of navigate through it, right? You, you sign some players in free agency. The needs suddenly look different. And then you, you still have that list of needs. But the other piece of it that you have to be mindful of after evaluating the draft class is the talent cliffs, Right. What are the talent cliffs? Are there X amount of players? Are there are there five different middle linebackers that you think can come in and be a starter for you? Or are there two? And how does that dictate the decisions that you make? Say you do need a defensive tackle, but you feel like there's maybe seven guys in the first three rounds that if you get one of them, you feel good about. Wide receiver, maybe you think there's 12 receivers that you like. So it takes a little bit of that urgency off and you can wait there. So it's it's understanding what you need, but also what's available. And what are those talent cliffs, and how do you prioritize your selections based on talent cliffs, but also what you need, right? you got to marry those two things, and all of the conversations we've been having are designed to get us those answers. The next one here comes from Pete, who says, A lot of fans don't have time to watch film on every prospect, and I'm no different. I find myself looking at big boards, reading scouting profiles, looking at RIS scores, watching film, and looking at some people that get highlighted along the way. My question is, how much film should someone watch before they form an opinion? I try to watch two or three games before making any firm statements. With that, though, I can maybe get through only 50 players between February and the draft. A little more if I cut some corners. It's a good question. I feel like I get this one a lot in terms of, well, how much film do I need to watch to be able to speak about a prospect? I'll tell you what I do. I, I watch at least three games, so there's no prospect I'm going to comment until I've studied at least three games. But from there, it's just a matter of being able to honestly tell myself, do I have this guy figured out? Do I know what this player is? And when I feel like I can answer that question, I'm done. And now that comes from a lot of experience and seeing comparable prospects over a number of years and then understanding most likely outcomes. There's so many times I pop on the film of a player and I'm like, yeah, I watched this guy before. It was three years ago. It was this player and this is what happened with him, right? So there's a lot of case studies that I continue to cling to. And it's an it's this process that you undertake when you scout a, a draft class and then you have to go back and continue to stay on top of it and figure out where you were right, where you were wrong and determine those whys to help 
be better moving forward with other evaluations, but you just watch enough film before until you can honestly say to yourself, I got this guy figured out. But I also enter every evaluation with the mindset of scouting like I'm afraid I'm going to miss something, right? And so you kind of layer all that together, but it's three games minimum, and then as much as you need to watch to be able to confidently tell yourself that you got the player figured out. All right, we got a bunch more to get to, including Stefan Diggs and why he fell to the fifth round in the draft. We're going to talk about that right after the break. But first, this show is brought to you by BetterHelp. Getting to know yourself can be a lifelong process, especially because we're always growing and changing. In fact, I was actually talking with my 18-year-old niece at lunch on Sunday afternoon, and we were talking about how differently I saw things when I was 18 compared to 25 and even 30 years old. It's a pretty fun conversation. And look, therapy is all about deepening your self-awareness and understanding because sometimes we don't know what we want or why we react like we do until we talk things through. BetterHelp connects you with a licensed therapist who can take you on that journey of self-discovery from wherever you are. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapist at any time for no additional charge. Discover your potential with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOn today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash LockedOn. The next one today comes from Matthew. Matthew says, Stefan Diggs is clearly a top five wide receiver in the NFL, yet he was a fifth round draft pick. What was he missing to not make him a day one or day two pick? I think the Bills need to draft a wide receiver, but I don't think they will come until the later rounds. What traits should Brandon Bean be looking for in the later rounds to capitalize on a late round receiver? All right, so this is a great question. Let's first talk about Stefan Diggs and why he fell to the fifth round and then talk about what Bean should be looking at to find late-round steals at wide receiver. So Stefan Diggs, big-time recruit coming out of high school. He's a consensus five-star recruit. There's not many of those every year. And then he goes to Maryland, and I will say this. I think he underachieved based on the expectations of the recruiting hype. And he underachieved, and he had injuries. In 2012, his his first year, he uh, missed time with an ankle injury. 2013, he missed the last six games of the season, uh, broke his right fibula. It was a season-ending injury. 2014, he missed a game due to suspension, and then two games due to a lacerated kidney. So he had injuries every single year and didn't quite fulfill all that promise of being a consensus five-star recruit. I think his best season, he had like over 800 yards. So I think that's what it came down to. A bit of an underachiever, modest production, injuries. Now, as for what Brandon Bean can look for to help him, I'm going to give you Brandon Bean's answer. I'll tell you a little story here. I was very excited. I got an opportunity to attend my first Brandon Bean press conference, right? Physically in person. And I wanted to ask him a question and I prepared to ask him the question. And the question was this, I said, Brandon Bean, what are some of the characteristics that you look for in wide receivers? You know what he told me? He said, Joe, I'm looking for guys that can get open and catch a football. I'm like, okay. I was really excited. First time talking to Bean, asked him that question and he hit me with the most obvious response in the history of the world. But I think there's some truth to it, right? Guys that can get open and catch the football. I mean, at its core, right? I know that's such a stripped-down version of it, right? But can they get open and catch the football? And I guess what I would say about that in projecting it to the NFL is do they get open and catch the football in ways that work in the NFL? I think it's that. I know that's very basic and very elementary. But that's what I loved about Khalil Shakir. And that guy fell to the fifth round too. Stefan Diggs, nobody questioned whether that guy can get open and catch the football. It was all the other stuff that got in the way. Focus on that. When they catch the football, are there tons of people around them all the time? Or are they getting open? Do they catch the football with firm, confident hands away from their body? 
Can they adjust to the football and catch it, whether it's low or to the right or left or up high? That's the stuff you're looking for. Anderson says, I have a question related to draft position groups and what fans should expect from them in years one and two, et cetera. Obviously, every player grows at their own pace based on a multitude of factors, internal and external. But in general, what position groups would you expect year one impact from a draft prospect in which routinely take longer to develop? Can you also put that in Bill's perspective for key areas of need, i.e. realistic year one linebacker, wide receiver, defensive end expectations? Thanks as always and keep up the incredible work. Thank you, Anderson. So I think just... Look, it, it can it can happen differently, like you mentioned, for all different players at all different types of positions, right? There's no tried and true anything when it comes to this. But I would say, generally speaking, when I think about the quickest developing positions generally and the slowest developing positions generally, this is where I come to. For the quickest, I think running back and wide receiver. Running backs come into the league pretty doggone close to their prime. And it can happen quick. Just think about James Cook. Pretty underrepped coming out of Georgia and looked pretty rough early on in his career. But by the end of the season, he looks like a guy that you feel like can be a big big time part of your backfield moving forward. The other position is wide receiver. We are seeing wide receivers come into the NFL and producing quickly like we have never seen before. I remember in the past, like late 90s, even sometimes early 2000s, you drafted a wide receiver. It was like two or three years before they did anything. And I think you can look at a career like Eric Molds and see that. That's pretty common. It just took time. But now with the way that high schools are throwing the football and colleges are throwing the football, these guys are coming in ready to go. And obviously the NFL has adopted a lot of those philosophies to their own self. So I think that's really happened. The slowest developing positions, tight end is always high on that list. I think it's hard for tight ends. First of all, they're often overlooked in college. So the opportunity is not really there to really refine themselves. But I always look at it like this. Tight ends are coming into the NFL, and they're learning to be offensive linemen and wide receivers. I mean, that's tough. And some of these guys are even playing like H-back, right, kind of moving, playing in the backfield a little bit. A lot of different alignments there and a lot of different responsibilities. So that's always pretty slow developing. And then I think interior defensive line does take some time as well, where these guys, they come in, their their reads are a little bit different. but beating interior offensive linemen in, in college, whatever level, is so different than in the NFL. And I think they're just challenged in unique ways, and they have to really rely on more technique than they ever had, right? Sometimes in college, these guys can just be bigger, stronger, faster than other guys and beat them, and you can just lean on that. Well, guess what? You get to the NFL, everyone's big, strong, and fast. you got to have technique. you got to have those X factors to really – be a difference maker. And I think sometimes that takes a little bit of time for those interior defensive linemen to unlock. Obviously quarterback, right? I mean, sometimes they come in and look like a million bucks, but for the most part, most part, these quarterbacks do take several years to really figure it out, but they got to play. So that's generally how I see that. Now, as for the bills and, you know, their key needs, I, what I like about a linebacker being able to come in and, and play and, and contribute from day one is what's around them, right? There's going to be a lot of continuity with that back seven. And I think that's going to be a big time asset to them. Having Daquan Jones playing next to Matt Milano, playing in front of Poyer and Hyde. I mean, that's got to be a dream for a rookie middle linebacker. And so I don't know that it always happens. I mean, look at Devin Lloyd with Jacksonville. Really had a, a rough rookie season. A lot of hype for him. Um, I think about Patrick Queen with the uh, the Baltimore Ravens. Now, he really emerged this past year, but his first couple of years were kind of rough. That definitely happens. I mean, Tremaine got better throughout his career. But I think the environment for the linebacker now compared to what Tremaine stepped into in 2018 is really different. You know, I think the good thing about a defensive tackle is I don't think there's a ton of need for them to come in and play a gazillion snaps right now, but next year that opportunity is going to be there. So I think that, the environment is good there. Same thing with wide receiver. I mean, the Bills could go and draft their wide receiver early and they can come in and really eat into Gabe Davis's market share and, and maybe challenge for 70, 75 targets. But what's realistic there? I think the Bills are in good shape to really not have to rely on a rookie in a tough spot, right? 
they might have to rely on rookies, but is it going to be a tough spot where there's a lot of instability around them? I don't think that's going to be the case, and I think that's why the Bills are really set up well to really, if you look at any position, feel like you can get good value and good production out of rookies next year if you need it. Don says, if the Bills don't come away with a legit tackle prospect in the draft, do you think they could look at Isaiah Wynn as an insurance policy slash depth for Spencer Brown? Either way, I think Wynn would be a major upgrade over David Questenbury at a swing tackle role. I'll tell you what, Isaiah Wynn's a good football player, a former first-round pick out of Georgia to New England Patriots, and, and any time he was on the field for the Patriots, I thought he was a quality impact player. Looks like a legit starter. However, he just was hurt so much, and that got in the way of him being able to just stack good season after good season because he was always injured. But even when he was coming back from injuries, it was like he came back, and if he played, he looked good. So I think Isaiah wins a starter in the league. I just There's too many injuries there to really rely on him, and that makes it difficult. And so whatever team gets Isaiah wins is going to get a good player, but are they going to be available, right? Your best ability is your availability. Nothing else matters if you can't be there for your team. I think that's a big question for Isaiah Wynn. And the medicals are everything there. And the fact that he's not signed right now tells us that, you know, there's got to be some concern out there about that stuff. So I like Isaiah Wynn. I'd like him for any team. Be nervous about paying him. And availability is everything there. Vin says, I would like to present you with a scenario and get your thoughts. Draft night, Bills package Ed Oliver, pick 27 to move up into the top 15. The Bills draft, and then he says, choose any position not named wide receiver. How are you feeling about the move? I don't know. I don't know if I love that. I'm not going to lie. First of all, this is hard for me to talk about like with just the information that I'm given. Because if you trade Ed Oliver now, I get like hyper concerned about defensive tackle. I don't know. The Bills moving up and trading away Ed Oliver in 27 and just getting Jalen Carter. Would they even want Jalen Carter based on some of the uh, character flags there? I'm certainly not trading up for a different defensive tackle. I don't know. To me, if the Bills trade up, that name better be Jackson Smith and Chigba. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to lie. That's who I'm hoping. And then if they part with Ed Oliver, you better give me a good old plan there at, at three tech. It gets me excited. All right, we got some fun stuff to talk about here in a moment, including three safety sets, trick plays, some of my uh, scouting process stuff first. But I need to tell you about FanDuel. Grand slams, no hitters and double plays are back, and there's no better place to get in on the Major League Baseball action than FanDuel, America's number one sports book. That's because right now new customers can step up to the plate with a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. Just go to FanDuel.com slash LockedOn, sign up, place your first bet, and get up to $1,000 back in bonus bets if you don't win. Maybe you like Aaron Judge to pick up where he left off with some home runs, a pitcher to go over on projected strikeouts. You can also build a single-game parlay with your favorite matchup of the day. So don't miss your chance to get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000 when you join FanDuel today. Just go to FanDuel.com slash LockedOn to sign up. FanDuel an official partner of Major League Baseball. All right, we got some more stuff to get to here today. The next one comes from Brian. Brian says, Joe, can you dive into why teams seem to be pursuing three starter quality safeties? You know, the Bills are doing it with Hyde, Poyer, and Rapp. The Seahawks, who have... Jamal Adams and Quandre Diggs recently signed Julian Love, two years, $12 million. Is it a question of having quality depth, or is there some type of three-safety scheme that is in vogue? And if so, what is it meant to counter? Yeah, I think we're seeing three safeties become more of a thing in the NFL. It's absolutely happening right before our eyes. And you, you certainly brought up some good examples there. The Patriots are doing it. Dolphins are doing it. Um, Panthers are are into that. Washington's into that. There's a lot of teams, Green Bay, Chicago, to an extent, a lot of teams are putting three safeties on the field. Not like all the time, right? Let's not get it twisted. It's not like a primary personnel grouping, but it's happening. And really this, this stems from a trend from the big 12, big 12 college football 
and, and what Big 12 is known for, well, is, is bad defense, but also spread offenses. And so as you've seen some variations of some of these three safety defenses becoming more and more effective going up against spread offenses, you're seeing the NFL copy it. So Baylor is definitely trend setting in that area. And we know that Sean McDermott has a relationship with Dave Aranda, their head coach, defensive, you know, I guess mastermind in college football ranks. Uh, Texas is kind of getting into it a little bit. Iowa State has been like really kind of the the poster child for that three safety set there in the Big 12 and some of their defensive success. So I think you're just seeing some copycat happening uh, against some of the trends that are happening in the NFL. And I think defensive coordinators are looking at three safety sets as something that could potentially be more effective against zone reads, against RPOs, you know, re, re, uh, run pass options. And you think about all these offensive packages that exist in the NFL today that are designed to make defenses wrong no matter what they do. If you make the right read on offense, the defense can't be right. They're they're putting defenders in conflict. I think maybe defenses are thinking more about, hey, if I have a third safety in there instead of a Sam linebacker or a slot corner or uh, another defensive lineman, right? Sometimes they're, they're going 3-3-5 three, three, or, or you can go 3-2 with six DBs. Yeah, that's 11, right? Three plus two plus six. That's, that's 11. You're seeing that. So there's a lot of different ways that you can put it on the field and, and space it. But I think it's about taking away some of this conflict that offenses are putting you in with maybe a little bit more speed and a little bit more ability to cover width and depth of the field because of what type of stress offenses are putting on you. I think defending middle of the field throws is big, right? Kind of congesting up that middle of the field with another safety and, and, inviting teams to throw the football more outside the numbers where those throws are further right in distance and they're harder right so they're low percentage they're lower percentage throws in the middle of the field and so I think it's all about that it's trying to take away the offense that wants to dictate terms to you and and, and dictate terms to them a little bit I think that that's kind of what's at the core of all of this and, and if the bills were able to to implement some of this with Poyer hide and wrap, I mean, you get excited because there's a lot of interchangeability and versatility there. Uh, I hope it happens because I think more of that can only help the Bills on defense. The next one today comes from Ken, who says, here is something I don't think I've heard you discuss. Under Brian Dayball, the Bills seem to use many more trick or gadget plays. Under Dorsey last year, I have a hard time remembering even one trick play the Bills ran. Same thing with special teams. Have you noticed the same thing, and you think it will change this year? Ken, I don't think I have talked about this, and I haven't really thought about it. I'll, I'll tell you this. Trick plays are cool. They're fun. I like them when they work. Um, but sometimes I think teams are a little bit unnecessary with them. They don't really move the needle for me. I don't really define offensive creativity with with trick plays. I think that they're interesting wrinkles to put in, and if you can build enough successful concepts, you can build them in and really put some teams into some funky situations, but for the most part, uh, I don't really measure offensive creativity in the NFL by the usage of trick plays. And so I think it's a fair criticism because maybe the offensive success wasn't everything that we wanted it to be. And with Josh Allen's injury, maybe it made a little bit more sense to tap into some of that. Um, but I think you're, I think you make a good observation. I just don't know how much it matters. I think they're fun. And, but like, I think defenses are getting smarter. The bills get a lot of zone looks. And I think when you get a lot of zone looks, it's hard to run trick plays because eyes are in the backfield and you know, you're know you not really getting a lot of backs to the line of scrimmage like in terms of defenders turning their back to the line of scrimmage. Uh, and so I think those are some of the big reasons why maybe it didn't happen as much and maybe it will more this year, but you're right. It didn't happen much. And I, I again, I don't know how much it actually moves the needle. All right, last one today comes from Teddy. Teddy says, when assigning draft grades, what percent split do you put on objective metrics like stats, RAS, school competition versus objective film and tangibles personality? Teddy, the way that I break down my uh, assessments, I grade everything numerically, so everything has a number assigned to it. And 90% of my grades are based on traits that I can scout on film. Just wh whatever important traits I find for each position, that's 90% of the grade. 10% is size and athleticism. Then I also give myself a discretionary five points. 
So I grade your size and athleticism based on historical norms, the traits that I focus in on when I study the film, and then I allow myself to move a player up or down five points based on those ancillary factors, whether it's uh, character flags, injuries, underachiever, overachiever. Um, you know, maybe they, they're a little bit small, but I like certain things about them and I want to bump them up because maybe that hurt them a little bit. And so it kind of gives me some of that, my own personal influence and that opportunity to, um, make sure that it stacks up the way that I want it to do. Right. It's at the end of the day, it's your grade, it's your rankings. And so you want it to be reflective of the way it should look and feel for you. And so I bake in a discretionary five points that I can move players up or down, not five, not more than five or higher than five, but a discretionary five up or down. Um, and that really can only take you, uh, depending on where I grade you, not that far, right? Maybe from uh, a high second round pick to a late second round pick. So it's not like a huge influence, but that's kind of how I, I break it all down in terms of how I assign grades to players. All right, folks, that's going to do it for us here today on the podcast. Some things to look forward to this week. We're going to do our defensive tackle primer as it relates to the Bills and the draft. That'll be this week. I want to do a deep dive on Gabe Davis this week. I'd love to get to my wide receiver draft primer. Uh, I have some other players I want to do some deep dives in. Of course, any big breaking news, we'll cover it all for you here on the podcast. So don't miss anything. Make sure that you're subscribed. We'd love it if you took a second to rate, review, and share the podcast. Have a great rest of your day, and I look forward to catching up with you again tomorrow.